please uh, welcome very warmly uh, Mr. Adam. He'll tell you about the data mining in the last election in Israel. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> okay, um, good afternoon everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Yuval Adam. And as the title suggests, I came here from, uh, ooh, is it this? I came here from, uh, from Israel to talk about the Israeli population census, about what it is, uh, about what we can do with it, and eventually why it uh, matters. Um, if you want to follow the slides online, they're online right now on this URL. It's a bit.ly 28c3-dmic. Um, so that's for the introduction. So back in 2001, uh, this thing started surfacing on various uh, file sharing networks on the internet. Um, what looks like a standard Microsoft Access uh, program, even though it's right to left because it's in Hebrew, um, actually has um, beneath it a very interesting database, and it's one that has actually never been seen before. Um, and the database is actually uh, the official Israeli government database that holds the entire, um, the, all the personal details of every single Israeli citizen, um, either uh, alive or that has deceased and has lived in Israel in the past. So all the details of every Israeli citizen are in this database and can be looked up through that uh, horrible uh, UI. Uh, this data is uh, the data that has been collected in the Israeli census uh, ever since um, the Declaration of Independence of Israel back in. Uh, 1948, um, so data has been collected ever since, and the leak, uh, like I mentioned, uh, started approximately around 2001. It has actually leaked uh, several times, and the last leak happened in uh, 2006. So, so what does this data have? Um, so the data schema, uh, once we take a look at the database underneath, we see basically most of the, um, most of the data that you would expect a government to uh, hold of its citizens. So we have a unique identification number, which is uh, given to any person the day he is born or if he immigrates to Israel, if he's an adult. Uh, so unique identification number, and then we have uh, obviously the name of the person, the date that he was born, uh, again, with the, with the country that he was born in. Uh, the gender um, status, that can be um, single, married, uh, divorced, or deceased. Um, the current address and phone number. And then we have um, interesting foreign keys that actually point to uh, this person's parents, to his father. Oh. Is that okay? Cool. Thanks. Um, so foreign keys that point to the person's uh, parents, to his father and to his mother. And if that person is married, uh, also foreign key to his spouse. Uh, there are also some other fields uh, and metadata, which I won't uh, talk about, uh, not too interesting. Um, the entire database holds approximately 9.2 million records. So as of 2006, that, uh, that's equivalent to roughly 7 million citizens uh, in Israel, and then 2.5 or 2.2, which are uh, deceased or whatever. Uh, <laughs> So, so that's the data schema. So when, again, when this thing came out in 2001, I was 17 years old, and I didn't really know what to do with this other than look up uh, famous people that I wanted to find their phone number. Um, and <laughs> that's all I knew what to do with. Uh, so that was back then. And, and, and fast forward to today, I'm kind of interested in uh, what we can learn from this data, uh, looking at the big picture. Um, Mining this data is not only a technical challenge, but to me, I think it's also important to understand where this leaves us as a society now that all this data uh, is out there in the open. So, so the first thing, ah, here you go. Uh, the first thing that I, that I asked myself was, um, was how easy is it to find someone in this database? Obviously, you know, people identify each other by, uh, by their names and not by unique IDs. We're not just numbers, we're, we're people with names. So uh, the first thing I, I wanted to find out is, given a name, how easy is it to find a specific person? Um, and it turns out uh, that it's pretty easy. Um, this is the, uh, the uniqueness distribution function, um, basically telling us that given a uh, single uh, pair of a name and a surname, uh, there is a 50% chance of that name being unique. So 50% of the names in Israel are unique to that specific person. Uh, and obviously that function goes up, so uh, we have a 60% chance uh, of a name being shared by uh, two people at most. Then we have a 70% chance uh, for finding uh, at most four people with that name. 
uh, and then it goes up to 100 percent, it's not on the graph, but 100 um, percent we reach uh, at the most common name in Israel, which is shared by, I think, more than 2,000 people. Um, so, so that's what the, the unique, uniqueness distribution looks like. Now, obviously, like I said, people share names, and we can always look up people by other, na by other fields. So if we, for example, take a person's name and a surname, and then look him up uh, against his city, we have 87% chance of finding one single record. Uh, that goes up to almost 100% once you uh, look up a person by his name and his date of birth. Um, and then you can always, you know, look up people by their name and filter by various criteria, um, you know, against whatever you, you know that the person that you're looking for um, matches. So finding someone in this database is not a tough task at all. The second thing that, that I noticed is that, um, if you remember from the data schema, we actually have uh, the, I, the, the unique identification number for every, for every person. Um, and then we have foreign keys. Uh, like I said, to, to the person's father, to his mother, and to his spouse, if he is uh, he or she is married. So in this example, we have the person uh, 1234 with his ID. We know that his parents are 12 and 34. Uh, and then, uh, you know, very easily we can see that the, the, the father 12 has, again, parents 12 and 34 is mother 34. They're married to each other. Um, pretty easy stuff, uh, foreign keys. So when I saw this, I was thinking, the logical thing to do in this case was take this thing uh, and throw it into a graph and see what happens. Um, and see if I can try to match, uh, not all the population, but most of the population, uh, throw it into a graph and see if I can find connections between each other. Um, and the easiest way to see how this works is to follow an example. So let's take, for example, a subject that was born in uh, 1985. And let's assume that, uh, for simplicity, that generations are roughly 25 years apart. So for this person, we, we have his data, and we know who his father and his mother are, and they were born in, say, 1960. Um, and then for those people, uh, again, we have, uh, we're just following uh, the, the root of the father, uh, for the mother, it's the same thing. So for the father, we know that uh, we know who his parents are, and they were born roughly around 1935. So this is what we have so far. The interesting thing is that once we get to the people that were born roughly around these years, um, there is no more data as to who their parents are. Uh, and that is from two reasons. One is that Israel uh, exists as a country only from 1948, and back then the population of Israel was no more than 300,000 people. Um, so either uh, their parents never were Israeli citizens, they still lived abroad, um, so that is one option. And the second option is that um, those, the, the generation uh, above them might actually have, um, have lived in Israel. Uh, the problem is that the data isn't uh, consistent, and unfortunately, for, for people roughly around those years, say up to about 1950, 55, 60, uh, we don't always have um, parental records and the data isn't always consistent. So going above that generation is a little bit difficult. But what we can say is that for this person, if, uh, if we know who his grandfather and his grandmother is, uh, that spans easily to his uncle and to his cousin. So, um, so given this person, uh, for, for most people, we are able to go up all the way to uh, the father and the grandfather, and from, that, uh, and from that generation to span out to uncles and cousins. So essentially giving us uh, the, the opportunity to map out uh, families spanning all the way to uncles and cousins. Um, okay, so what does this graph look like? So like I said, we have approximately 9 million nodes, uh, and using this data only, only the, the, the strict uh, foreign keys that we use, uh, we get approximately 40, 420,000 connected components, which if you divide it by the nodes, it's uh, an average of uh, families of 20 people. So essentially, using this data only, we can, um, we can build a graph of families of up to 20 people and then span relationships from there. Uh, it's interesting to note that um, the graph connectivity can be uh, much stronger if you use other metadata and other heuristics, which I won't go into now because we don't have time, but, um, but this connectivity can definitely be, can be improved and then you can, all, you know, you can spend for, uh, relationships further apart. So that's about building a graph. Now, uh, I mentioned it uh, very shortly at the beginning. Uh, the data has been leaked um, over, um, over a period of almost 10 years. So the, the first leak that we know of dates back to uh, 1998, the, the version of the data dates back to 1998. Uh, and then the, the, um, 
the data has actually leaked several times up until 2006. So usually when leaks uh, happen, they are uh, recognized and plugged immediately, not in Israel. In Israel, the leaks happen again and again and again and again and again, over 10 years, um, which is kind of sad. Um, so this actually uh, puts us in a unique uh, situation because um, we actually have the opportunity to analyze the data as it changes over time, over a period of 10 years, which is a lot of time, uh, and a lot of data. And um, so the question is asked is, is, what can we learn if we take two versions of this data and diff them again, one against another, an old version against a new version? And what will we find out? So uh, diffing basically gives us three types of results. The first result would be new records. Now, these are uh, kind of trivial cases. Um, new records can be uh, one of two things, either um, children that were born sometime between the old version of the data and the new version. So say a child that was born in 2005 would not exist in 2001, obviously it would exist in 2006. Uh, we have another case which is uh, people that have uh, immigrated to Israel, uh, and we can know this uh, from the date of the birth. So say someone that was born in 1966, you would expect him to be uh, um, in the old version, but he's not, and he is in the new one. So we can verify that by looking at uh, the, country, uh, the country of birth of this person uh, and some other metadata, and we can conclude that this person has in fact immigrated to Israel at a certain period between these two years. So new records are, are pretty easy. <clears throat> then we have updates. Now updates, uh, again, fall into two categories. One is, uh, is standard uh, updates on, on the data of a person. So people uh, can change their name, people can change their, uh, their addresses, their phone numbers, uh, things like that. So data that can change, we would expect it to be different between the old version and the new version. Um, and then we have people that have uh, passed away sometime between these two years. So a person that was, um, existed in 2001, sometime in that, um, between those years passed away, is now marked as deceased. He is not deleted from the database. So people, if you're in the database, you're in there for life, or for death, or for whatever. Uh, <laughs> so, so again, those are pretty easy, which brings us to the last and most interesting case. Redactions. People that exist in the older versions say in 2001, and do not exist in 2006. If you're like me, you're going, what the fuck? Uh, <laughs> um, yeah? What about divorces? Sorry? What about divorces? Are they going to check on? Uh, yeah, they found, they found the category of, of the status change. Yeah, and, and questions for, save the questions for later. I'll save some time for that. So, um, so again, redactions, uh, we have no idea. Now, um, Honestly, your guess is as good as mine. I have no idea what these things are, okay? <laughs> um, I, I really can't say anything more than that because I honestly don't know. Um, now, this is under the assumption that the data has leaked from the same source uh, across the entire period. So, obviously, there can be um, problems if, if you take data that has not, is not consistent with the older versions uh, for, for various reasons. So assuming that the data has actually leaked from the same source and is consistent, these are uh, some sort of redactions. That means someone sometime decided that this person existed back then and does not exist anymore. Again, your guess is as good as mine. Um, and data redactions are interesting in another context, also um, relating to Israel. And that is that Israel has a law that requires every map vendor um, to pass a satellite imagery that it wants to publish through the government, essentially giving the government a chance to uh, censor whatever the government thinks is, um, sh should be censored. Uh, giving us an interesting, um, interesting case that um, Google, for example, is not required by Israeli law to, to do whatever, while uh, Israeli map site is. So basically giving us uh, um, a map of the same area with one, uh, one place that isn't censored and the other one very neatly photoshopped. Uh, so, so this is interesting because if someone wants to redact a piece of information, uh, if, he, if he can count on that uh, data being the single source of data, then you're fine. As long as the Photoshop guy did a good job, then you, then you, you managed to hide whatever it is that you wanted to hide. Uh, but the moment that you have another version of the data to, to, to diff against, that's where the problems start. Um, essentially making the redaction not only useless, but, but even harming the efforts of hiding whatever it is that you want to hide. Because now you can say, hey, wait, there's something here that I don't know what it is from, from, this, from this zoom, but if I zoom in, I might be able to, and, you know, and they're going to say, wait, so I want to zoom in and see what someone's trying to hide from me. 
So, so this is a very interesting dilemma. So what is the problem with all this? Uh, so sensitive uh, and private data has been leaked, and social engineering has uh, obviously become much more easier. Uh, and we know for a fact that in the past several years, uh, this data has been used uh, for various uh, identity theft scams and um, other scams mostly related to money. Um, but this data actually has been out for 10 years, and how do we adapt to, to this situation? Because what's done is done. We can't take this data back, and it's not going to change. Uh, and the problem is, the problem is that um, is the future, it is that we haven't actually learned anything or learned much from, from this case and how we uh, adapt it to, to new laws. Earlier this year, uh, the Israeli parliament passed uh, the biometric data law. Uh, essentially, it's a law that allows the Israeli government to, to regulate the creation of smart ID cards. So essentially, ID cards that uh, enable biometric data collection um, for, the, for the purpose of making authentication much stronger than what is today with, uh, with the existing ID cards and mitigating the problem of fake double IDs. Uh, Israel has a problem that uh, a lot of its IDs are actually fake and people have double identities uh, for, for not the reasons that you would think, but, but for your reasons of usually for criminal activity. Uh, so that's a problem that the Israeli government would want to, uh, would want to take away. Uh, therefore, they, they pass this law. The problem with this law, which is generally a, a good idea, uh, seeing that the world is going to use uh, much stronger identification means, um, biometric passports, etc. So, so, so the, the, the direction is definitely good. The problem is in the details, as always. The system should work something like this. The government issues um, new smart identification cards that have uh, the ability to save data on them. And um, the moment that a, a new citizen receives the identification card, the government takes two of his fingerprints, hash them, and throw them on the card. So essentially, the card now has uh, hashed biometric data of this person, which is fine. Uh, and the next time the person wants to go to the bank, for example, um, he would show them a card. They say, OK, this is you. Let's see your fingerprints. Fingerprints, hash them, match it against the card. The person is, is who he says he is. And this is fine. Again, this is going with most of the standards of, of how the world is going with biometric passports. We also know that all the, as we've seen, all the identities are saved in a central database, which again is something that is pretty normal. You would expect a government, um, a modern Western government, to, to have some sort of, uh, of records of who uh, the people are that live in, in the country. So again, this is fine as long as this thing doesn't leak, as it has. Um, now, the problem starts with what this law uh, also lets the government do. And this law essentially gives the government uh, the opportunity to put all the biometric data unhashed and unfiltered in this database. And they're saying that loud and clear. So the government essentially wants to start building a database that now has not only our personal records, but also our biometric data, and saved in a very non-secure uh, way. And this is a problem. Now, uh, we all know that once a database, database like this exists, everyone wants their hands on them. So, so from, from starting off from a project of, of a single government office, now all of a sudden lots of uh, people want their, their, their hands on this database, and everyone, everyone need, needs access to this database, from the police to whatever. Um, and again, this is a problem. Uh, the Israeli public has expressed a lot of concern over this law. Um, Unfortunately, Parliament has not actually addressed um, any of the, of the concern raised from the public. Uh, so much that, in fact, uh, Professor Adi Shamil, which, if, if anyone knows, is the S in RSA, clearly a guy we should not listen to, um, also the, the recipient of the 2002 Turing Award, um, and he actually reviewed uh, the law and all of its uh, technical specifications and actually um, gave some feedback as to what can be improved so that the law still maintains the purpose uh, required by the government, but also maintains the privacy of the citizens much more strongly. And, and even that feedback uh, has actually been, uh, been denied. So that says something about how much due process went into this law. Um, I'm going to cut it a little bit short so I can leave some time for questions. So I'm going to uh, end on this note. We've seen that all of the data of Israeli citizens is out in the public, and we've seen that for, the, for a period of 10 years, nothing has been done to, to stop that leak. So in that situation, I would be asking, would it be wise of us to start collecting more data, biometric data, in a database that we know is not sufficient enough to hold this? And I think uh, society should uh, much more closely monitor uh, the data collection policies uh, that the government uh, maintains on them. Thank you very much.
Sorry. We do have an additional five minutes for questions, so please put your hand up if you have any. There we have questions one? before. So Over there? Yeah. Oh, just a quick question. How many deletions did you have in the database? Uh, it's hard for me to say. I can't really say. Because I, I honestly, I don't really know. It's, it's a little bit of a problem. I have no debt, more, more data on that. So, sorry. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Right there in the back. I can't Please hear anything. Use so the microphone. microphone. Yeah. Um, you counted uh, the doubles and uh, so for, of the names. And what is the most common name in Israel? The most common name? Wow. Uh, I think David Cohen or something, <laughs> or Moshe Cohen or something. A any like Jewish name you can think of. It's probably the most unique name. <laughs> Yeah. Okay, do we have any question from the IRC? There's one question from... Wait, I'll get you a <laughs> microphone. There's one question from Crocodile Erian. Uh, it's how <laughs> can we get a copy of this database? Wow, okay. Um, I'll say that it's not, it's not that easy, but it's definitely not impossible. Uh, like I said, this data is out in the open. Uh, it's harder to get it today than what it used to be uh, several years ago, but if someone uh, is inclined to, he can definitely find this data. So yes, it is possible. Okay, we've got another question from the audience. Uh, yeah, the record deletion. Uh, one guess would be uh, oh, uh, that it might be people who just uh, went out from Israel and gave up the, their citizenship. Do you know about the protests, uh, what they do with their data? Uh, that's an interesting angle, um, and it is possible. Um, I, it's kind of, again, it's kind of hard to say because the, the data is not always consistent. Um, I'll just say that I know of cases of, of uh, again, giving up your citizenship is not uh, something that you would usually do, uh, but there are people that uh, do not live in Israel anymore that still exist in the database, I can tell you that. I don't know if, what the exact citizenship status, um, but that is, that is definitely an option, yes. Um, how do you know or ensure the authenticity of the data and is there any possibility or uh, means to find whether there were intentional poisoning of the data for various purposes, hiding or I don't know. Okay. Um, so we do know, first of all, we know that the government acknowledged this leak um, and it has acknowledged it for, the, for all the period that, that this data has been leaking. Um, so this, uh, that, the data definitely came from a government source, and we also know that from the various metadata that we see on the database. Uh, in regards to, to poisoning the data, that is definitely possible. Again, this, this data is leaking all around the internet, so it's definitely possible for someone to find it, corrupt it in some way, and, 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 and throw it away. Um, I'd say that it's not entirely, um, that's not something that you would commonly see. Uh, just for example, um, all the ID numbers um, have a check digit at the end of them, and from a simple check you can see that all of them are indeed uh, consistent. So that's just one field, and you can always uh, verify that against other fields. Um, but I, again, it is definitely possible. I have no data uh, confirming or... or okay, that. we have two more questions from the audience. Hi. Um, the Israeli government has been relatively reluctant to publish numbers regarding the number of Israelis who are actually leaving the country, so moving away. Right. Does the database actually have any information about this? How are, you know, how, how are people who actually moved away and left the country um, marked in the database? Yeah, um, well again, people leaving the country aren't really recorded. I mean, that's not a field that uh, the government would, would, would uh, hold as to where this person lives right now. Um, so that's not something that is recorded in this database. Uh, there is various metadata you can try to guess from as to is this person, let's say, active? Uh, is he somewhere around? Um, that's not something that I researched entirely, um, but it does exist. So, um, and again, that's as long as uh, people haven't given up their citizenship, which like I said, I'm not sure uh, how it is exactly processed in the database. So there's no real data on that. Sum it up. Okay, one last question. Um, 
is the, uh, did you show a simplified database scheme or is it really not possible to track data like devotion or adoption or something like this? Okay, so it's, it's definitely possible, not directly from, from the fields that, that we've seen, but using various heuristics such as um, uh, looking at several uh, children of a person and seeing that some of them have different mothers, then you can assume, you can conclude that this person has indeed divorced and has children from, from, other, uh, from other parents. Um, so, yeah, pretty much it. So you can conclude it by looking at the data um, from a higher level, but not from the specific fields. Um, so yeah, there's a lot that you can, you can learn just from, you know, from looking at various fields and, and making different conclusions at, for, from the data. So, yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank, Thank you, you very much. again, Joao.